Rick and Morty have become a pop culture phenomenon, essentially by mining pop culture for jokes, backdrops, and entire premises, meaning that it's only a matter of time before it mines its own self as a product of popular culture. Some kind of pop culture inception, as if it would pimp its Rick and Morty by putting a pop culture reference in its pop culture reference. Movie and television references are the bread and butter of the Rick and Morty world. Three seasons of Rick and Morty is practically a survey of the last few decades of entertainment. You don't have to understand all the references to understand the show or get the jokes, but sometimes they're more than just a reference. Let's take a look at some of the biggest ones. Royland and Harmon are not just the creators, but they are also huge fans of the fringes of popular culture. On his podcast, Harmon Town, Dan Harmon has discussed a number of campy films that have had an influence on him. There are plenty of people to heap praise on Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, but Harmon grew up on Saturday afternoon HUF movies, early HBO filler, and video rental bargain bins. That comes with a fascination with films like Xanadu and one of the strangest Sean Connery movies ever made. And Sean Connery has made some strange movies. Zardoz was an early 70s science fiction movie with an insane premise. Briefly, it involved an advanced society who kept a barbaric society in check by having giant floating heads deliver them guns so they would fight among themselves until Sean Connery in a weird red wrap and a ponytail hitched a ride on the floating head and invaded the advanced society. And you thought the 70s was just bell bottoms and disco. Oh no, it was much weirder. In Raising Gazorpasaur, Morty becomes involved with a sex robot, only to find out it's from a Zardoz planet where the floating heads deliver the robots to the savage men as a way for the women of the planet to retain control. It isn't just old weird cult movies that Harmon can become obsessed with. While running Starburns industry, including show running Rick and Morty with Royland, he's still able to keep up with modern movies as well. But that doesn't always mean that he's on board with the general consensus on some of them. Harmon has complained about the logic behind the popular Christopher Nolan movie about people entering other people's dreams, Inception. In the same way that Rick is essentially Justin Royland doing an exaggerated impression of Dan Harmon, Rick can sometimes be a conduit of its creator's feelings about some pop culture. In the second episode of the first season, Rick decides to insane accept Morty's math teacher into giving Morty an A so that Rick can use Morty in his adventures, with Rick overtly calling out the logic of Inception in the episode. The episode borrows the same going deeper logic where time keeps expanding, in this case by Rick putting sleeper holds on various characters in Morty's math teacher Mr. Goldenfold's dream and going in to their dreams. In those dreams, they encounter Scary Terry, a legally distinct parody of Freddy Krueger, another dream-based character. They are able to defeat Terry by deconstructing the common horror movie taunt of, you can run, but you can't hide. Who said overthinking movies couldn't be useful? There's a threat in horror films that the source of the terror is a form of existential punishment for something that the victims have done or their essential weaknesses. Teenage slasher movies have the monster hunting the promiscuous and drug-using teens. Mastermind murders are generally setting their traps for the people they feel have wronged them. One common reoccurring trope for horror movies is the cursed object. Regardless of the premise or the setup, the cursed object will do two things to its victims. First, it will provide them with something valuable. Some power or ability allows them to achieve what they want. The second thing that the cursed object will do is corrupt that desire in some way. Usually, ironically, this is why we can't have nice things. It was a trope used by Twilight Zone in countless syndicated supernatural series. It was also the premise of Stephen King's Needful Things, which gets a direct call out in Something Ricked This Way Comes, where Summer starts working for a man who calls himself Mr. Needful. Of course, Rick sees through this and undermines the Needful Things store by opening another store across the street that removes the curse from the items, making them simply magical. Until he gets bored and burns the place down. Hey, he's still Rick. Superhero movies currently rule the box office. Just like any time there's something that is massively popular and culturally dominant, everyone has an opinion on them. It's generally pretty easy to stake out some sophisticated credibility by dissing the popular things as terrible. Usually, there's plenty of vanguards of critically acclaimed culture who will agree with you to give that some credibility. By now, we've all heard that Scorsese doesn't consider Marvel movie cinema. Apparently, cinema requires putting Robert De Niro in a mob movie, which is not to say that you can't critique something that you love now and then. Royland and Harmon 
both grew up on geek culture, but Cynical Rick would of course have a few notes on the superhero genre. Vindicators 3 wasn't as much a direct one-to-one -one parody of any specific superhero property, but rather a critique of the superhero genre broadly. Rick and Morty are unofficial members of a team of superheroes, which excites Morty, but doesn't thrill Rick. A blind, drunk Rick sets up a Saw-style set of games to underline various critiques of the superhero genre, from overwrought hero concepts to cliche origin themes, all to impress the junior member that laughed at Rick's jokes. Sometimes Rick's motives can be a little simpler than he lets on. Blumhouse Pictures has become an indie hit-making production company by making niche films with loyal audiences. One of their surprise hits is The Purge series. The Purge revolves around the premise that, in the near future, the United States passed a law that one night a week from sundown to sunrise, all crimes, including murder, are legal. Presumably, that means that everyone gets their violent and criminal urges out of their system for the entire year. It was popular enough to spawn four movies and a series. When Rick's ship runs low on wiper fluid, Rick and Morty descend on a nearby planet that seems peacefully rustic. Of course, they achieve this by being a purge planet, though this one calls their purge the Festival. Naturally, this is the kind of thing that entertains Rick, that is, until it gets particularly gruesome. Running across a lighthouse keeper, they enlist him to help get a signal that will help them escape. In exchange, Morty has to listen to the lighthouse keeper's screenplay. It's another chance for Harmon to comment on things that frustrated him reading writing samples for potential writers for the show. In this case, it's a script that starts late in the action, then suddenly flashes three weeks earlier. Morty doesn't like it either. Every once in a while, there's a science fiction movie that comes out that is both a vehicle for the story and a platform for a leap forward in special effects. Star Wars was an evolution of model and blue screen effects. Superman was built on its advancement of the flying effects, saying, you'll believe a man can fly. Bullet time was as much a selling point as Keanu for the Matrix series. Sometimes the effects are created for the movie. Sometimes the movie is created for the effects. Fantastic Voyage was one of those films. It dealt with the submarine crew being shrunk down to microscopic size and entered into a body of a sick scientist. There have been a lot of similar movies since and as many parodies, but this is Rick and Morty and one reference is never enough. Rick shrinks Morty and sends him into a drunk hobo to retrieve the Dr. Hammond type from the theme park he's built inside the man. Yeah, Rick's ideas are, uh, pretty out there. Anatomy Park is a parody of the Michael Crichton series of theme parks turning out to be death traps like Jurassic Park and Westworld. Did you know both stories were from the same guy? Do you think he had a bad experience at a theme park as a kid? As is probably clear at this point, Rick and Morty hardly ever restricts itself to a single TV show or movie to parody or reference. While other shows might content themselves to do a parody episode about a popular subject, Rick and Morty is not just any kind of show. Their references and parodies can come layered thick and fast. In the episode The Rick Lantis Mix Up or Tales from the Citadel, we get a look at life in the Citadel after Rick transported it into the middle of a Galactic Federation prison and killed the Council of Ricks. It's a loosely associated anthology of stories that revolves around a rookie Rick police officer getting trained by his weathered veteran partner Morty, a factory worker worker Rick who has become disgruntled, a group of Mortys about to graduate Morty school who go looking for a wishing well, and a Morty who's running for the first president of the Citadel against some Ricks, including one based on the founder of the Rent is Too Damn High Party, Jim McMillan, with his fantastic facial hair. Move over, Chester Arthur. There are references and parodies throughout the episode. The rookie Rick Cop's first day is reminiscent of Training Day, where a rookie cop is taken in and made complicit in the veteran cop's corruption. The politician Morty has elements of the political satire Bob Roberts. The graduating Morty's plays on coming-of-age stories like Stand By Me. The second episode of Rick and Morty was also an episode that took on more than a few references from other shows and movies. While Rick and Morty were traipsing through both Inception and Nightmare on Elm Street, Jerry had asked for a way to make their dog Snuffles smarter after the dog pees on the floor in front of Jerry. Rick tells Jerry the point of having a pet is to feel superior to another creature and warns Jerry not to pull on that thread, but gives Snuffles a helmet that makes him smarter anyway. With the helmet in place, Snuffles understands commands, but Snuffles is frustrated that he can't communicate with the humans. Examining the helmet, he finds out that it only has one of the four battery slots filled. 
Once Snuffles fills the remaining batteries into the helmet, he's not only able to communicate, but to build himself a set of robot arms and legs, eventually building the other dogs their own exosuits and smart helmets. He also takes objection to being neutered, but then hey, who wouldn't? His rise to power is also referenced in the title Lawnmower Dog, a play on the 90s cyber thriller Lawnmower Man, where a simple gardener is given super intelligence via virtual reality and tries to take over the world. Snuffles also refers to himself as Snowball, which is the the name of the pig in Animal Farm who loses control of his revolution to Napoleon's militarism. Modern science fiction's obsession with dystopia is not a new thing. The 1970s and 80s had its fair share of dystopian stories set in desolate wastelands as well. Zardoz was only a part of it. One of the most iconic and lasting portrayals of a post-apocalyptic future came from an Australian filmmaker and the actor he would help make a star, and a hot-rodded Ford Falcon. Max Rokotansky was a highway patrol officer on the edge of a collapsing society when a rogue biker gang took his family from him. Then apparently the world went to war for water and gasoline and uh, everyone started digging up sports pads and upcycling them into fancy war gear and driving stripped down hot rods across the outback. Mad Max has spawned four movies and influenced its own yearly post-apocalyptic festival called Wasteland. When the Smith kids needed a break from their divorcing parents in Rick Mancing the Stone, they end up in a road warrior style post-apocalyptic earth complete with an Immortan Joe stand-in from Mad Max Fury Road and a Thunderdome. Maybe it was all the disco that made people want society to end in the 70s. Rick and Morty doesn't just borrow and parody film and television in their plots or backdrops, there are references speckled throughout the episodes, some made in passing and some that carry through side by side with the rest of the parodies and references. References are so much a part of the Rick and Morty experience that they're also a part of the episode naming convention. Before the age of streaming and complete seasons on home video, the actual names of the episodes were more of a personal reference for the makers of the show. Some shows would include the title before the episode, like a chapter name, but for the most part, the names weren't widely known. Naming conventions sometimes would become popular, like the show Friends, where all their episode names begin with the one with. Rick and Morty, of course, has a naming convention. The first is to, as often as possible, Rick into the name, often replacing a similar sounding part of the word. The other is to play off the name of movies. Rick's Escape from Prison plays on the Shawshank Redemption as the Rick Shank Redemption. The Road Warrior episode, which revolves around Rick going after a powerful element, is called Rick Mancing the Stone, a play on the movie Romancing the Stone. Almost all of them are a twist on a movie or TV title. Those are just a fraction of the movies and television shows that Rick and Morty have borrowed from to poke fun at modern society. What are your favorite ones? Which ones would you put on this list? There's so many to choose from. Let us know in the comments and hey, while you're at it, why not hit that subscribe button so your inbox will get references to our latest videos. Thanks for watching.